sometimes we don't see our difficulties as being God's way of growing us and making us more like Jesus. Someone said that um, God uses those circumstances as heavenly sandpaper to knock off everything in our lives that's not Jesus. And uh, we all experience those pains. Instead of complaining, maybe we need to thank God for how he's working in our lives. Well, we want to look uh, as we continue in the study of Daniel um, and talk about Daniel's dilemma. We're going to speak about speaking truth to power today from Daniel chapter 5, verses 1 through 31. All of you uh, normally know this as the uh, chapter that talks about the handwriting on the wall. And uh, we are familiar with that story, especially if you grew up in church and went to Sunday school. This is one of those stories you heard all the time but maybe not uh, preached on too often. But uh, today we want to look at this passage in light of current events and and some of the things that uh, we as Christians need to do in our country uh, at this time. And uh, we are looking at Daniel chapter 5. We won't read the whole chapter. We'll pick out selected verses as we go through and uh, discuss this passage uh, this morning. If you have your insert, we encourage you to follow along as we go through this passage today. Now, I chose this uh, sermon title several months ago, not knowing then that the week before I preached this sermon, that the Obama administration would be involved in three major investigations or scandals. We're all aware of uh, all these increasing questions about the IRS abuses, the Benghazi memos, and the Justice Department snooping into the Associated Press emails and phone calls. Uh, The current Obama administration would not be the first to be involved in questionable practices. Power corrupts. Power controls. Power tries to protect itself no matter what the cost. And someone needs to point out the abuses and faults of power. And, And I just want to say today, based upon Daniel and other biblical characters that we read about in the Bible, that God's people need to speak truth to abuse of power and hold leaders accountable to God. Amen? Amen. Amen. This is the task, the prophetic task the church has. And too often in our world today, the church has failed in this regard because we've identified with one political party over another and we've lost our prophetic voice. But Daniel was not that way. Daniel was a prophet who spoke truth to power. And so we want to see how he did that here in Daniel chapter 5. Now I want to say that uh, as we talk about uh, those in power, we want to remember that we also might be in power. We also might be those who are in charge of certain things. If you're a parent, you have power in your household. If you are a boss, you have power in the workplace. If you are someone who has authority of any kind, you have certain uh, uh, authoritative powers over those who are under you, whether it be in the military, the business world, the government, or or just uh, home life or uh, church life. And so we need to realize that when we speak about government, and we speak about speaking truth to power, we're not just talking about uh, political leaders. It could be anyone who has authority and anyone that needs to be honest about their leadership positions. This is especially true in the church. In Orlando, in the last month, we've had three major mega church pastors who've resigned because of infidelity and adulterous affairs. And one has resigned because he was caught in uh, child sexual molestation. And so we need to understand the church needs to have truth spoken to it by people of God as well. It's not just government. It's not just business. It's not just uh, family. We all have places of authority that need to be spoken to to keep us honest before God. And that's why I say in this first point, as we find here in Daniel chapter 5, that we all eat the feast of reckless defiance. We all eat the feast of reckless defiance. Now, what am I talking about here? Well, well, as uh, Daniel chapter 5 points out, 
uh, King Belshazzar was giving a banquet and he was eating this feast and he had thousands of his officials there and his wives and concubines. He had those who uh, he wanted to entertain. But what we don't find from this passage is the historical background. At the very hour he was giving this feast, the armies of the Persians were marching down surrounding Babylon, diverting the river that went under the wall into Babylon, and were able to march thigh deep under the walls of Babylon and conquer the city. All that was going on the night this feast was being given. And you need to understand that he was feasting and he was dishonoring God on the very night he was about to fall. Amen. And all of us can get in those situations. Amen. We're eating the feast. Let's eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. Not knowing that it might just happen that tomorrow we die. Amen. And our life will be held accountable. We think we're in a good position. No one can touch us. We can do anything we want, not aware that the seas of our downfall are very close. Yeah. So we all eat this feast of reckless defiance. And the reason for that is, is that power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Now, I don't remember who said that. I've heard a lot of people quote it. I'm sure there was an original guy somewhere yeah. that said that. And some of you probably yeah. know who it was. But it's a great statement. Yeah. Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Amen. People that seem to get into authority positions and have control over others suddenly feel it is their right, it is their entitlement to uh, control, coerce, manipulate, malign, uh, do whatever they want with those under them. Mm -hmm. and, and this happens in churches. And it happens in government, and it happens in business. Yes, and it even happens in the home. Yes. And here's what happened that night. King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. So they brought in the gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines, drank from them. And they drank the wine as they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Mm -hmm. Now, there's many things that were going on, uh, as we see in that feast that was taking place. Belshazzar was being very reckless, not, not even taking care of his city, assuming that he had everything in place, that he had all the guards in place, where he could never fall. And yet he didn't understand that he was vulnerable to a downfall. And in the process of that, puffed up in his own pride, in his own self-security, he, he began to uh, use these utensils that came out of the temple from Jerusalem. These were temples that were most holy before God and were used in the temple setting for sacrifices right. and offerings to God and prayers before the Lord. And here he and his concubines and his officials were drinking wine out of them right. and eating off the utensils and plates. And they were making mock of the God whose temple these items came out of. Right. How do we know that? Because it says, as they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze and iron and wood and stone. That's right. Now the Babylonian gods, they had a god for just about everything. And so I'm sure they had a god for wood and bronze and iron and gold and silver. But uh, in our day and age, we can interpret that to be, and they praise the gods of materialism right. and consumerism mm -hmm. and of stock markets. Mm -hmm. And they praise the god of greed. Yes, because our country has not been immune to that. Amen. And we went through three or four years of a downturn in the economy because of the greed of a few swindlers Amen. in our banks and our stock market. Amen. And we, as God's, as God's people and as other people in the United States, suffered because of their greed yes. and their materialism. So we still see this thing going on today. Babylon was under siege. Power corrupted so much that this man, this king, could not see that he was vulnerable to problems. Now, we need to understand that uh, 
The Obama administration is not the only one that's guilty of being in positions of power and using their power to uh, manipulate others and to cover things up. I remember uh, before he died, Robert McNamara came out with a book. And in this book, he admitted that the Johnson administration had lied to the American people about Vietnam in order to secure more funds and troops. And, and when I was a teenager protesting the war in Vietnam, I said, you're lying to us. But everybody else said, no, they're not, they're not, this is true. And then years later, we find out they were lying to us. Mm -hmm. Power corrupts. H.R. Right. Haldeman lied to Congress, and he said that he and Richard Nixon had no knowledge of anything about Watergate. <laughs> Haldeman, Nixon, and all the crew, including Chuck Colson, including a guy by the name of Magruder, all went down. <laughs> All went down because they were caught in this cover-up at Watergate. Later, Nixon had to resign in disgrace for his involvement and his lies to the American people. Sure. Ronald Reagan denied any knowledge of the Iran-Contra affair. Exchanging weapons for the release of American prisoners have been held under the Carter administration for uh, many, many days. And yet there's still questions about Reagan's involvement in that. Bill Clinton, this went on for years, denied involvement with Monica Lewinsky, only to have the truth come out. And later he lied to the American people and as a result was impeached about that whole affair. George W. Bush justified attacking Iraq based on reports that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. And later we find out this was incorrect information it wasn't true, and we went to war on false premises. Now you tell me which administration is the most evil, the most incorrect, the most in error, the most wrong. All of them were corrupt. All of them lied because power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So whether you're Republican or Democrat, you should hang your head in shame because we let these things go on. And all too often, God's people didn't speak up. That's right. mm -hmm. We didn't say a word. And now Barack Obama's administration continues to stonewall questions about Benghazi, the Associated Press phone records, and the IRS. I'm telling you, if you're not mad about the Internal Revenue Service, That's right. there's something wrong with you. Amen. You Amen. need to be on the telephone. You need to be on your emails. You need to be calling Congress right now demanding that the IRS come clean, yes. demanding that the IRS be disbanded, yes. I'll go so far as to yes. say. Because that group has such power, they can destroy people, and they did destroy Amen. people. Mm -hmm. Now, I just read this morning, Robert Parham uh, posted an article about how um, the IRS officials, when they were trying to uh, allow these tax-exempt groups to come through, were asking religious groups, what are the content of the prayers you offer on Sunday morning? Can you believe this? This has no business being done in America. So why are we mad about it? Why, why isn't Barack Obama coming clean about this? Why doesn't he say, all of you who are in authority in that uh, IRS need to resign? I don't care if you came from the Bush years or the Barack Obama years. You did wrong. Get out of here. Robert Parham wrote a book, or wrote an article saying political abuse of power calls for moral critique. He said, responding to the disclosure that the Justice Department spied on the AP, Representative Frank Wolf of Virginia recalled another abuse of power error. It is the arrogance of power and paranoia. I think it's shocking. It reminds me of the Nixon days. If they can do it to the AP, they can do it to any news service in the country. Parham goes on, today the political abuse of power involves the misuse of a position of authority with an arrogant sense that one has the right to twist, to control, to intimidate or to press advantage over others for personal gain, partisan gain, or both. When challenged, the perpetrators of the political abuse of power often respond with denial, misdirection, and cover-up. And then the justification that wrongful actions are pursued for noble goals. Amen. I'm telling you, 
The seeds of destruction have been planted, and these people are about to fall. Because we all eat of the feast of reckless defiance. Yeah. We defy God, yeah. and we just defy everything good in order to control other people and keep our power in place. Amen. It happened with Belshazzar, and it happens today with us. That's why we can say that the handwriting on the wall appears to us all. Amen. The handwriting on the wall appears to us all. At some point, you come to recognize you're doing wrong. At some point, it becomes clear to you, you you've, you've taken the wrong road. At some point, someone points the finger and says, what about that? And you've got to fess up. Yeah. You've got to face it. You've got to see the handwriting on the wall. Yeah. And that expression is common in our, our language. It's one of the idioms we use all the time. And quite frankly, it's being used in the sense that wake up. Amen. Wake up. You can't go on the way you're doing and deny, deny, deny. You have to face the truth. You have to face the reality. Amen. And Belshazzar had to face that. You see, he didn't learn from his father. We said last week about Nebuchadnezzar, who had a great fall for seven years. He was on his, uh, on his fours eating grass like an animal because right. he had lost his mind because he had failed to honor God. Yeah. And pride had gone before a great fall. You see, that's what happens to each one who's unwilling to admit they're wrong, unwilling to admit that they uh, need to confess to others and to God. Amen. Pride goes before a fall. And that's what happened here to Belshazzar. Suddenly the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale and he was so frightened that his legs became weak yeah. and his knees were knocking. Amen. He was scared to death. Watching this hand right on the wall. And he knew this was a message from above. Yes. What does it mean? He asked for all the wise men to come in. Show me, tell me what this means. Nobody could. And finally, the queen mother came in and she says, uh, in your father's administration, grandfather's administration, uh, there was this wise man named Daniel. I think he's retired now, but uh, maybe he's still around. You could pull him in. He seems to have the spirit of the gods in him. Amen. So they bring Daniel out of retirement. And that should tell you all who are retired and older, God still uses you in your old age. Amen. 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 And Daniel comes in. And, and Daniel is not afraid to speak the truth. Belshazzar says, I'll pay you, I'll reward you. And Daniel says, keep your money. I don't want anything to do with it. Amen. But I will tell you what God has to say. This is a message from God to you. Belshazzar, of all the people, you should have known. You remember what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. Yes. You remember when he lost his power and how God restored him and how Nebuchadnezzar honored Almighty God after he realized that he had sinned. Yes. You of all people, Belshazzar, should have recognized that and honored God, but you didn't. You dishonored God. You rebelled against God. And as a result of that, you're seeing the handwriting on the wall. Now, this isn't the first time we've had experiences like this in the Bible. You, you remember uh, David and Bathsheba. And David had manipulated things using his authority as king to seduce Bathsheba. And then um, she became pregnant. And, and so he uh, manipulated his troops in such a way that um, Uriah the Hittite came back and uh, he tried to get Uriah to go back to his wife Bathsheba. And so they could have relations and he could cover up his sin. But Uriah was more honorable than David. He said, no, I'm not while everybody else is up fighting, I'm not going to go to my wife. Yeah, and so right. he slept at the gates and he was more honorable than, than uh, David was. True. And so finally, David just sends the order to Joab, the king's um, commanding officer. He said, have Uriah go down there by the wall as close as he can get. Put him at the front of the battle and maybe he'll die. Sure enough, Uriah went there, someone threw something off the wall, and Uriah was killed in battle. And David went and married Bathsheba. It was a disgraceful thing. Yes. But yet it was covered up. No one else knew except maybe Joab and Bathsheba. 
So what happened? God sent a prophet named Nathan. He told a story to the king, and the king was furious and said, well, that person ought to be arrested. That person ought to be charged with a crime they committed. And Nathan pointed the finger at David and said, you, king, are that man. Amen. You're the man who has sinned. The handwriting was on the wall. David recognized what had happened to him. And as a result of that, the child that Bathsheba bore became ill and died. And despite David's fasting and prayers, God took the child anyway. And David repented. Psalm 51 is an excellent psalm that explains how repentance should take place and confession of sin should take place. As David poured out his heart to God, admitting that he had done wrong. You see, Nathan spoke truth to power. He pointed out the sin, the error that was taking place. And as a result of that, David repented. You see, the handwriting on the wall gives us a warning. It gives us a choice. Either we repent or we fall. We, we turn back to God or we continue on our way. When, when all these Benghazi reports came out and it became clear that there was a lot of changes were made in all the memos. Um, my, my friend David, who's a high school buddy and he's, uh, lives up in Connecticut and he's very liberal and, and he wrote on there that uh, uh, it doesn't matter what uh, the Obama administration did, the reason why Benghazi happened was because of George Bush. And I wrote David, I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, he cut all the funding to the consulates. They didn't have any protection because of that. I'm going, that may be true, but why didn't uh, Obama do something about that and change it? Yeah. You're trying to say that everything that happens, even now, is Bush's fault? Give me a break. Yeah. If Bush was wrong, say he was wrong. If Obama's wrong, say he's wrong. Don't cover this stuff up. Expose it for what it is. Amen. Quit this partisan stuff that allows lies to go on. Amen. Quit it. Speak the truth no matter who is wrong Amen. and who is in power. Peggy Noonan, who used to be in the Reagan administration, wrote an article for the Wall Street Journal. She said, the White House is reported to be shell-shocked at public reaction to the scandal. But why? Were they so high-handed, so essentially ignorant, that they didn't understand what it would mean to the American people when their IRS, the revenue-collecting arm of the U.S. government, is revealed as a low, ugly, and bullying tool of the reigning powers? If they didn't know how Americans would react to that, what did they know? And why, in the matters of the Associated Press and Benghazi too, does no one in this administration ever take responsibility? Turning General Eric Holder doesn't know what happened, exactly who did what. The president speaks in the passive voice. He attempts to act out of indignation, but he always seems indignant at one thing, that he's being questioned at all, that he has to address this, that fate put this on his plate. Listen, I don't know who did what, but pride goes before a fall, and if you're not willing to see the handwriting on the wall, the only alternative is it's going to come back to haunt you and it will catch up to you, Amen. and you Amen. will fall. Yes. Somebody in this administration needs to speak up and tell the truth, Amen. or else there's going to be a great fall. Now let me close with this. We have to have someone speak the prophetic word of truth to power. Daniel did that. He wasn't afraid to do that. Daniel spoke up. He spoke out. He pointed the finger at Belshazzar and told the truth. Now I want to know what happened when all this has come out about the IRS and Benghazi and the AP reports. I want to know where the press was. Do you know the, the press is supposed to be that group of individuals and, and organizations that keep our government honest? They're the ones who are supposed to be the watchdog for the people. But the press let us down. When Kermit Gosnell, who committed all those butcherous abortions in Philadelphia, 
was continuing to uh, be exposed for what he had done in murdering babies that had been born and, and allowing a patient to die on the operating table. When all that was being exposed, the press didn't say anything for a long time. Just a few little articles here and there stuck away. Why? Amen. Who are they trying to protect? That, that's, that's, that's stuff Hitler's people did. Amen. And yet they didn't report it. Why not? They're supposed to be the ones that pull that kind of stuff out of the open and expose it. Amen. Were, were they trying to be politically correct? Were they trying to cover up for an abortion industry that they, they think is the way most Americans agree about? I'm just asking the question. Were they trying to protect Planned Parenthood? What was going on? Why weren't the press out on top of this? It wasn't until after a few organizations began to point it out, the pro-life groups began to point it out over and over and over that the press finally put it on the front page. And fortunately, the court system agreed and this man has been uh, convicted of murder. Where was the press when Benghazi blew up? They just let that thing slide until eight months later, it finally came back to haunt them. Amen. You see, the press let us down. They were asleep at the wheel. We need to understand that if the press isn't going to do its job, somebody has to do that job. Amen. And I think the church has let us down too. Amen. Because God's people have been so involved politically with both sides of the table that they can't speak anymore to truth. We need some people who aren't tied in with any political groups to stand up and point the finger and say, you're wrong. Yes. Repent. Amen. Get right with God. Get right with the people that you're supposed to govern. Amen. God's people has to have to spend, stand up and speak the truth to power. Amen. Just like Nathan. Just like Daniel. Just like Peter did when he was arrested for speaking about Jesus. Amen. Robert Amen. Parham says this in his article. One ought to be able to count on faith leaders to provide a moral critique of the wrongness of the abuse of power without regard to political leanings or alliances. Amen, Amen Robert. Amen. 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 And, and we as God's people, we have a voice. We have a vote. Amen. That's right. If enough of us gather together and speak out against all these abuses, Amen. we can see things change. Well, what can you do locally, you say? I don't have much voice here. Sure you do. You can do a lot in your city government. Right now, there's a group called Action Network. They're going to meet this Thursday at the United Church. And, and they are talking with the local county and city officials saying, we need a fair wage ordinance in order to make sure people don't get cheated out of their wages. Oh, you don't think the local businesses would do anything like that, do you? Of course they do. And that's why this group has come to the front, saying you, you need to be fair about the wages you give instead of cutting people's salaries and not giving them what they've worked for in overtime and such. We, we have the local immigrant issues coming to, uh, up. And on June 1st, they're trying to get a meeting with Representative Ted Yoho about the immigration laws that Congress is talking about right now. And you say, all that immigration stuff, why? We don't need any more illegal aliens. Have you really studied what's going on? Do you really know what the immigration laws are all about? How unfair they are? How completely confusing they are? And how it's been used as a political tool to hurt people's lives? This is a major issue. Amen. And the church needs to be speaking up about it. And fortunately, this group that's going to meet with Ted Yoho are doing that. They are God's people meeting with a representative trying to say changes need Amen. You have the power to do something. You have the power to speak the prophetic word of truth to power. Amen. Notice what Daniel said. But you, Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled yourself. Though you knew all this, instead you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You praise the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Right. Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. And this is the inscription that was written. 
Many, many tekoparsi. And here's what these words mean. Now notice what he said there. You did not honor the God who holds in his hands your life and all your ways. That's right. Amen. Amen. And Daniel pointed the finger and said, Belshazzar, you knew better, but you sinned. And we as God's people need to point to those in leadership Amen. when they do morally wrong things Amen. and say, you did not honor God. You sinned. Amen. You sinned, you sinned, and you harmed the people you govern as a result. Amen. We need to speak the truth in love. So what do these words mean? Mene. God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel. You have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Paris. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Amen. Daniel just told the truth. Belshazzar, your sin has led to a great fall. There's no way to recover now. It's too late for you. Now what can we learn by this? What are some truths to live by for each one of us? Yes, amen. Just recognize that our days are numbered. Yes. Our days are numbered. Notice uh, Daniel told Belshazzar, God has numbered the days of your reign. Well, God has numbered the days of your life. Yes. And each one of us have to be accountable for the way we live our lives. Are you holding yourself accountable to your God? Are you honoring him with your words and your life? With the positions he's given you? With the authority he's given you? The places he's put you? And also God judges our lives and choices. God is looking at the way you live your life. Yes, and he's judging it. Amen. And one day it'll come out in the open the way you lived your life. Mm -hmm. The secret things behind closed doors as well. Is everything that's out in the open. It's all under God's inspection. Amen. He's looking at your choices and the things you do and how it affects other people. Just like he looked at Belshazzar's choices and judged him as a result. And that's the key word from the New Testament. We reap what we sow. Yes. We reap what we sow. Amen. We sow that which is life and health and wholeness and goodness. God will give you a, a good harvest. But if you sow that which is corrupt and vile, yes. that which is murderous and treacherous, that which is evil, you'll also reap the results of that Amen. as well. Mm -hmm. God numbers our days. Mm -hmm. God judges our lives and choices. And we reap <coughs> what we sow. Mm -hmm. God is looking at this world. And he's looking at us as a church, yes. wanting to know if we are going to stand up against that which we see is wrong in this world. Let me just close with a story. Peter Yancey tells about, or Philip Yancey tells about uh, the Orange Revolution that occurred in the Ukraine in 2004. You may not have heard of this, but uh, something happened then. Remember the Soviet Union was going through changes and the Ukraine was wanting to become independent, have their own democracy, uh, after the Soviet Empire collapsed. And um, if you think our elections might be dirty, you don't know anything about um, the elections in, in the Eastern Bloc. Uh, what happened there, Viktor Yashenko challenged the entrenched party that was in control. And he nearly died from a mysterious case of dioxin poisoning. He found out later his enemies were slowly poisoning him to death so he wouldn't run against them. But against all advice, his body weakened, his face disfigured by the poison. He remained in the race. So on election day, when the votes were counted, or about to be counted, uh, the poll said that he had a 10% margin, a 10% lead in the polls. And so the results began to be reported as they counted the votes. And finally, that evening, the state-run television station recorded, ladies and gentlemen, we announced the challenger Victor Yashenko has been decisively defeated. What? He was ahead by 10 points. What's going on here? <coughs> the government authorities had not taken into account one aspect of Ukrainian television when they told their lies. You see, they had a little translator down in the corner of the TV that was for the hearing impaired. And she was using sign language. 
translating everything that was being pulled on the television. That little screen and the bigger screen, the lower right-hand side of the television, this woman who was signing to the deaf mute began to say, I'm addressing all the deaf citizens in the Ukraine. Don't believe what the authorities say. They are lying and I'm ashamed to translate these lies. Yashinko is our president. Nobody knew what she was signing on the television. But all the deaf people, inspired by this translator, Natalia Dimitri, led the Orange Revolution. They began to text message their friends. And they began to have calls go out. And soon journalists found out about it. And journalists began to question the party line that was being advertised. And then finally, over the next few weeks, as many as a million people wearing orange flooded the capital of Kiev to demand new elections. <laughs> the government finally buckled under the pressure, consenting to new elections, and Yashinko emerged as the winner. <laughs> One girl who had a platform spoke out against her authorities. She spoke the truth. She spoke to power and told what was right. And goodness prevailed. Now you might say, preacher, what, what does this have to do with me? I just want you to know this, is that you have a place in God's kingdom. Amen. God has put you where you are for a reason, yes, old or young, yes. as Daniel's life demonstrates. And you have a voice. Yes. And you can look around you and you can change your world if you're willing to speak up and speak truth to power. Be sure to tell what God wants from other people's lives. Now for those who are in those authority positions, who've been guilty as charged, there's hope for you. Belshazzar rejected the offer of repentance and he fell. But others have repented and told the truth. Yes. And they've come back and been spared as a result of that. 2 Peter 3.9 says this, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Amen. That's why God sent his son, Jesus. Yes. That's why Jesus went to the cross, yes. to take punishment for your sin and my sin, mm -hmm. and for all the corruption that goes on in this world, yes. so that people have an alternative, oh. not to remain in their sin, deny and deny and deny, but instead to confess their sin, yes. to find forgiveness of their sin, and to have a changed life Amen. as a result. Have you done that? Have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Have you accepted his forgiveness of sins? Have you allowed him to come into your life and give you a new life from the inside out? You can do that today. Amen. Let's all stand together. We're going to sing our closing hymn, and the invitation is going to be given. We want you to come as we sing. God has spoken to your heart. Maybe it's to encourage you to say, Pastor, I want to join in the fight and step out against evil in this world. Or, Pastor, I've never accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Pastor, I want to be a part of a church that stands up for truth and speaks to power. Whatever it is God is saying to you today, won't you come and obey the Holy Spirit on this Pentecost Sunday? Let's sing together.